Chapter One of Choice Cookery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Choice Cookery by Catherine Owen. Preface Choice Cookery is not intended for households that have to study economy, except where economy is a relative term, where, perhaps, the housekeeper could easily spend a dollar for the materials of a luxury, but could not spare the four or five dollars a caterer would charge. Many families enjoy giving little dinners, or otherwise exercising hospitality, but are debarred from doing so by the fact that anything beyond the ordinary daily fare has to be ordered in, or an expensive extra cook engaged. And although we may regret that hospitality should ever be dependent on fine cooking, we have to take things as they are. It is not every hostess who loves simplicity that dares to practice it. It was to help the women who wish to know at a glance what is newest and best in modern cookery that these chapters were written for Harper's Bazaar, and are now gathered into a book. It is hoped by the writer that the copious details and simplification of various matters will enable those who have already achieved success in the plainer branches of cookery to venture further, and realize for themselves that it is only the first step that costs. I have to acknowledge my indebtedness to Mrs. Clark, of the South Kensington School of Cookery, to Madame de Salis, and those Epicurean friends who have cast their nets in foreign waters, and sent me the daintiest fish they caught. CHAPTER One, INTRODUCTION By choice cookery is meant exactly what the words imply. There will be no attempt to teach family or inexpensive cooking, those branches of domestic economy having been so excellently treated by capable hands already. It may be said, en passant, however, that even choice cooking is not necessarily expensive. Many dishes cost little for the materials, but owe their daintiness and expensiveness to the care bestowed in cooking, or to a fine sauce. For instance, cod, one of the cheapest of fish, and considered coarse food as usually served, becomes an epicurean dish when served with a fine hollandaise or oyster sauce, and it will not even then be more expensive than any average priced boiling fish. Flounder served as sole normand conjures up memories of the famous Philippe, whose fortune it made, or it may be of luxurious little dinners at other famous restaurants, and is suggestive, in fact, of anything but economy. Yet it is really an inexpensive dish." But while it is quite true that fine cooking does not always mean expensive cooking, it is also true that it requires the best materials and sufficient of them, that if satisfactory results are to be obtained there must be no attempt to stint or change proportions from a false idea of economy, although it must never be forgotten that all good cooking is economical, by which I mean that there is no waste, every sense worth of material being made to do its full duty. In this book, the object will be to give the newest and most recherche dishes, and these will naturally be expensive. Yet for those families who depend upon the caterer for everything in the way of fine soups, entrees, or sauces, because the cook can achieve only the plain part of the dinner, it will be found a great economy as well as convenience to be independent of this outside resource, which is always very costly, and invariably destroys the individuality of a repast. Many new recipes will be given, and others little known in private kitchens, or thought to be quite beyond the attainment of any but the accomplished chef. But if strict attention be paid to small matters, and the directions faithfully carried out, there will be no difficulty in a lady becoming her own chef. I propose to begin with sauces. This is reversing the usual mode, and yet I think the reader will not regret the innovation. The cooking to be taught in these pages being emphatically what is popularly known as Delmonico cooking, very much depends on the excellence of the sauces served with each dish, and as it is no time to learn to make a fine sauce, when the dish it is served with is being cooked, I think the better plan is to give the sauces first. They will be frequently referred to, but no repetition of the recipes will be given. Before proceeding further, I will say a few words that may save time and patience hereafter. Of course it is not expected that any one will hope to succeed with elaborate dishes, 
without understanding the principles of simple cooking but many do this without perceiving that in that knowledge they hold the key to very much more and i would ask readers who are in earnest about the matter to acquire the habit of putting two and two together in cooking as they would in fancy work if you know half a dozen embroidery or lace stitches you see at once that you can produce the elaborate combinations in which those stitches are used so it is with cooking the most elaborate dish will only be a combination of two or three simpler processes of cooking perfectly done that is a sine qua non something fried roasted boiled or braised to perfection and a sauce that no chef could improve upon but to recognize that this is so that when you can make a chateaubriand sauce or a bernet perfectly and can saute a steak the famed filet a la chateaubriand or a la bernets are no longer a mystery and that one who can make a clear mint jelly and roast a chicken has learned all but the arrangement of a chaufrande in aspic and will make apparently complicated dishes simple i go into these matters because i hope to cause my readers to think about the recipes they will use when they will see for themselves that even the finest cooking is not intricate nor in any way difficulty it requires intelligence and great care about details no half attention will do any more than it will do in any other thing we attempt whether it be high art or domestic art in making sauces or reading recipes for them it simplifies matters to remember that in savoury sauces by which i mean those served with meats or fish there are what the french call the two mother sauces white sauce and brown all others with few exceptions are modifications of these two that is to say bechamel is only white sauce made with white stock and cream instead of milk allemand is the same only yolks of eggs replace the cream and so on through the long list of sauces belonging to the blonde variety the simple brown sauce becomes the famous chateaubriand by the addition of glaze or very strong gravy and a glass of white wine and is the mother of many others equally fine this being so it will be seen that it is of the first importance that the making of these two mother sauces should be thoroughly understood in order for the finer ones based on them to be successfully accomplished it will clear the way for easy work if i here give the directions for making one of the most necessary and convenient aids to fine cooking the above-named glaze to have it in the house saves much worry and work if the soup is not just so strong as we wish the addition of a small piece of glaze will make it excellent or we wish to make brown sauce and have no stock the glaze comes to our aid to have stock in the house at all times is by no means easy in a small family especially in summer with glaze which is solidified stock one is independent of it six pounds of lean beef from the leg or a knuckle of veal and beef to make six pounds cut this in pieces two inches square or less do the same with half a pound of lean ham free from rind or smoky outside and which has been scalded five minutes put the meat into a two-gallon pot with three medium-sized onions with two cloves in each a turnip a carrot and a small head of celery pour over them five quarts of cold water let it come slowly to the boiling point when skim and draw to a spot where it will gently simmer for six hours this stock as it is will be an excellent foundation for all kinds of clear soups or gravies with the addition of salt which must on no account be added for glaze to reduce this stock to glaze do as follows strain the stock first through a colander and return meat and vegetables to the pot put to them four quarts of hot water and let it boil four hours longer the importance of this second boiling which may at first sight appear useless economy will be seen if you let the two stocks get cold the first will be of delightful flavor but probably quite liquid the last will be flavorless but if the boiling process has been slow enough it will be a jelly the second boiling having been necessary to extract the gelatin from the bones which is indispensable for the formation of glaze strain both these stocks through a scalded cloth if they have been allowed to get cool heat them in order to strain Put both stocks together into one large pot, and let it boil as fast as possible with the cover off, 
leaving a large spoon in it to prevent it boiling over, also to stir occasionally. When it is reduced to three pints, put it into a small saucepan and let it boil more slowly. Stir frequently with a wooden spoon until it begins to thicken and has a fine yellowish-brown color, which will be when it is reduced to a quart or rather less. At this point watch closely as it quickly burns. When there is only a pint and a half, it will be fit to pour into small cups or jars, or it may be dried in thin sheets, if required for soup in traveling. To do this, pour it into oiled tin pans an inch deep. When cold, it can be cut in two-inch squares and dried by exposure to the air till it is like glue. One square makes a cup of strong soup if dissolved in boiling water and seasoned. However, if it is put into pots, it must not be covered until all moisture has evaporated and the glaze shrinks from the sides of the jar. This may take a month. The most convenient of all ways for preserving glaze is to get from your butcher a yard of sausage skin. Tie one end very tightly, then pour in the glaze while warm by means of a large funnel. Tie the skin just as you would a sausage as close to the glaze as possible. Cut off any remaining skin and hang the one containing the glaze up to dry. When needed, a slice is cut from this. Of course, any strong meat and bone soup can be boiled down in the same way, and where there is meat on hand in danger of spoiling from sudden change of weather, it can be turned into glaze and kept indefinitely. I have found glaze five years old to be as good as the first week. End of chapter 1「Two of Choice Cookery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Choice Cookery by Catherine Owen. Chapter 2. Sauces. In addition to the glaze, for which the recipe is given in the preceding pages, and which will make you independent of the stock pot, there are several other articles involving very small outlay, which it is absolutely necessary to have at hand in order to follow directions without trouble and worry. It is often said by thoughtless housekeepers that cooking books are of little use, because the recipe always calls for something that is not in the house. This is a habit of mind only, for the very women who say it keep their work basket supplied with everything necessary for work, not only the everyday white and black spools, nor would they hesitate to undertake a piece of embroidery which required quite unusual combinations of color and material, and to be obtained only with difficulty. Grant a little of this earnest painstaking to the requirements of the cooking book at the start, see that the herb bottles are supplied with dried herbs, when fresh or not attainable, the spice boxes contain the small quantity of fresh fine spices that is sufficient for a good deal of cooking, and red and white wine and brandy are in the house, all of which should be kept in the store closet for cooking alone, and not liable to be out when wanted. The so-called French herbs are rarely found in American gardens, yet might be very readily sown in early spring, as parsley is, but although seldom home-grown, they are to be found at the French market gardeners in Washington Market, and can be bought fresh and dried in paper bags quickly for use. I say dried quickly, because unless the sun is very hot, much of the aroma will pass into the air. It is, therefore, better to dry them in a cool oven. When they are dry enough to crumble to dust, free the herbs from stems and twigs, and put them separately into tin boxes or wide-mouthed bottles, each labeled. The expense of herbs and spices is very slight, and they are certainly not neglected among kitchen stores on that account. It is merely the want of habit in ordering them. In addition to these articles, a bottle of capers, one of olives, one of anchovies, canned mushrooms, and canned truffles should be on hand. The latter should be bought in the smallest sized cans, as they are very costly, but a little goes a long way. Families living in the country often have for a season more mushrooms than they can use. In the few days in which they are plentiful, opportunity should be taken to peel and dry as many as possible. When powdered, they give a finer flavor than the canned mushroom, and may be used to great advantage in dark sauces. The French chef classes all white sauces as blonde, and calls the jar a very smooth, thick white sauce, which he keeps ready-made as a foundation for most of the family of light sauces, 
his blonde or belote. This explanation is given because directions are often found in French recipes to take half a pound of velote or of blonde. The mistress of a private house may not find it wise or necessary to keep a supply of sauce ready-made, although to one who has to supply a variety of sauces each day it is indispensable. But the day before the dinner party sauces can be made, and covered with a film of butter to prevent skim forming, and can then be heated in a bain marie when required for use. Almost every chef has his favorite recipe for velote, or white sauce, but they differ only in points that are little essential. The foundation is always the same, as follows. Put two ounces of butter in a thick saucepan, with two ounces of flour. Tablespoons approximate the ounce, but weight only should be relied on for fine cooking. Let these melt over the fire, stirring them so that the butter and flour become well mixed. Then let them bubble together, stirring enough to prevent the flour sticking or changing color. Three minutes will suffice to cook the flour. Add a pint of clear, hot, white stock that has been strained through a cloth. This stock must not be poured slowly, or the sauce will thicken too fast. Hold the pint measure or other vessel in which the stock may be in the left hand. Stir the butter and flour quickly with the right. Then turn the broth to it all at once. Let this simmer an hour until very thick. Then add a gill of very rich cream. Stir, and the sauce is ready. This is undoubtedly the best way to make white sauce, which is to serve as a foundation for others, or is intended to mask meat or poultry, the long, slow-simmering, producing an extreme blandness, not to be attained by a quicker method. But circumstances sometimes prevent the previous preparation of the sauce, in which case it may be made exactly in the same way, only instead of a pint of broth, but three gills should be poured on the butter and flour, and a gill of thick cream stirred in when it boils. The sauce is finished when it again reaches the boiling point. This is the foundation for the following grand sauces. Poulette, Allemande, Ousselles, Soubise, saint mon hold Perigot, Supreme, besides all the simpler ones, which take their name from the chief ingredients, such as caper, cauliflower, celery, lobster, etc., etc. For sauces that have vinegar or lemon juice, it is better that the boulette, or white sauce, should have no cream until the last minute, or it may curdle. My object in giving the recipes for sauces in the way I intend, that is to say, by building on to, or omitting from, one foundation sauce, is to dispel some of the confusion which exists in the minds of many people about the exact difference between several sauces differing from each other only very slightly, a confusion which is only added to by reading over the fully written recipes for each, as many a painstaking, intelligent woman's headache will testify. As we progress, the exact difference between each will be explained. Bechamel. This sauce differs from the white sauce only in the fact that the white stock used for the latter need not be very strong. For bechamel it should be either very strong, or boiled down rapidly to make it so, and there should always be half cream instead of one-third, as in white sauce, and when required for fish the stock may be of fish. White sauce is frequently, perhaps most frequently, made with milk, or milk and cream, in place of stock, in this country, and answers admirably for many purposes, but would not be what is required for the kind of cooking intended in these pages. Most readers know how to stir, and it may seem quite an unnecessary matter to go into, Yet if only one reader does not know that to stir means a regular, even, slow circling of the spoon, not only in the center of the saucepan, but round the sides, she will fail in making good sauce. Stir, then, slowly, gently, going over every part of the bottom of the saucepan till the sides are reached, pass the spoon gently round them, thence back to the middle, and so on. In this way the sauce gets no chance to stick to any particular spot. A small copper saucepan is the best possible utensil for making sauce, as it does not burn. The rule for seasoning is a level salt spoonful of salt to half a pint, pepper one-fourth the quantity. This, however, is only when the stock is unseasoned. If seasoned, only salt enough must be added to season the cream and eggs. Allemande Take half a pint of white sauce. Add to it half the liquor from a can of mushrooms, 
and half a dozen of the mushrooms chopped fine let them simmer stirring all the time five minutes then remove from the fire set the saucepan into another containing boiling water have the yolks of three eggs ready beaten put a little of the sauce to them beat together then add the eggs gradually to the rest of the sauce which must be returned to the fire and stirred until the eggs begin to thicken then it must be quickly removed and stirred until slightly cool season with a salt spoonful of salt a fourth of one of pepper and strain carefully it must never be forgotten that in thickening with eggs the sauce or soup must not boil after they are added or they will curdle yet if they do not reach the boiling point they will not thicken only keen attention to the first sign of thickening will ensure success if a failure is made the first time look upon it as the first step to success for you have learned what the danger looks like make the sauce again as soon as possible so that your eye may not lose the impression it is worth considerable effort and it is really only a matter of a few minutes each time to make allemande sauce well for in doing so you also learn to make hollandaise and several choice sauces as will be seen by those that follow poulette sauce make allemande sauce as directed in the foregoing recipe add a wine glass of white wine if sweetbreads or chicken are to be cooked in the sauce as is not unusual of course the eggs must be left out until the last thing anything served with this sauce is called a la poulette sauce a la dexel chop fine a dozen small button mushrooms or half a dozen large ones parsley and chives of each enough to make a teaspoonful when finely chopped of lean ham a tablespoonful and one small shallot fry gently in a tablespoonful of butter but do not let them brown stir these into half a pint of white sauce simmer three or four minutes then add two yolks of eggs as for allemande and the last thing a half teaspoonful of lemon juice and just enough glaze to make the sauce the shade of a pale suede glove this sauce is used cold to coat meats that have been cooked in paper and many that are afterwards to be fried in bread crumbs for which directions will be given in the entrees dishes termed a la duxel are among the most recherche productions of the french kitchen villeroy sauce make half a pint of white sauce which as in the case of bechamel may be made of fish stock when for use with fish chop half a dozen mushrooms and add a gill of liquor to the sauce half a salt spoonful of powdered thyme or one sprig if fresh two sprigs of parsley and half a bay leaf simmer for fifteen minutes strain through a scalded cloth replace on the fire add a piece of glaze as large as a hazelnut or a tablespoonful of strong meat gravy just enough to give it the shade of the palest cafe au lait thicken with two yolks of eggs as for allemande sauce all articles served with this sauce are termed a la villeroy it differs from duxel only in having no ham nor acidity from the lemon also all flavor of onion is omitted End of chapter two chapter three of choice cookery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by marianne choice cookery by katherine owen chapter three white sauces supreme sauce gives its name to several dishes dear to epicures supreme de volelle supreme de toulouse etc it is made with a pint of thick white sauce a pint of very strong chicken broth four stalks of parsley and six white peppercorns boiled down to half a pint stir sauce and broth together until thoroughly blended then boil rapidly down till thick again taking great care it does not burn add one gill of double cream and half a saltspoonful of salt if the stock was already seasoned boil up till thick enough to mask the back of a spoon strain and the last thing add a small teaspoonful of lemon juice when the white sauce has to be made expressly for the supreme it is easier to use strong chicken broth in place of ordinary white stock then it is not necessary to add it after the term to mask the back of a spoon 
is a common one to indicate the proper thickness for sauces but to the untrained eye it may not be easy to decide just what masking means most sauces should be thin enough to run quite freely from the spoon yet not so thin as to leave the color of the spoon visible through the coating of sauce it will retain if it be dipped into it there should be a thin opaque coating or mask to the back of the spoon sauce of this thickness is produced by using one ounce exact weight of flour of fine quality to half a pint of liquid meat fish or vegetables over which sauce of this consistency has been poured will be quite masked but the sauce will not be too thick to serve readily with a spoon this consistency is worth some practice to attain for it is the perfection of sauce making white sauce when intended for the foundation of others it must be observed is made twice as thick to allow for the addition of cream wine or stock the only advantage in a private family of making it thus thick is when perhaps two or three sauces are needed for a dinner for example a plain white sauce for a vegetable caper lobster or cardinal for other purposes and perhaps poulette duxelle or other pale sauce for an entree but when one sauce only is required it is best to make that one from the beginning that is to say make white sauce with the additions that form it into allemande supreme or whatever you require saint menehould sauce is in these days chiefly associated with pig's feet a la saint menehould but is good for several purposes it is simply half a pint of white sauce into which a dozen bruised mushrooms a gill of mushroom liquor a large teaspoonful of finely chopped chives with the sixth of a salt spoonful of pepper and one of salt are allowed to simmer until the sauce is the same thickness as before the addition of the mushroom liquor that is to say thick enough to mask the spoon strain return to the saucepan and add a teaspoonful of finely chopped sage leaves if for pig's feet or parsley for other purposes boil once add half a teaspoonful of lemon juice and the sauce is ready bernays sauce this is one of the most difficult sauces to make on account of the danger of the eggs curdling but by the following method the work is rendered more sure than by the usual plan it has been said that the terrors of a cook are Rene's sauce and omelette souffle but neither is really difficult great care only is necessary for success with each chop four shallots fine put them into a saucepan with half a gill of tarragon vinegar and half a gill of plain vinegar boil till reduced to one tablespoonful then add one gill of white sauce mixing well stand the saucepan in another of boiling water then add one at a time three yolks of eggs beating each one well in before adding the other and on no account let the sauce boil remove the saucepan from the fire when the eggs are all in and show signs of thickening have ready three ounces of butter cut into small pieces drop in one at a time and with an egg whisk beat the sauce till the butter is blended then add another piece and so on till all the butter is used if added too quickly the butter will oil therefore great care must be taken to see one piece entirely blend before adding another the butter will probably salt the sauce enough but if not add a very little salt this sauce should have the appearance of a welsh rabbit when ready to spread in other words it should be very thick smooth and dark yellow soubise this sauce which transforms ordinary mutton chops into cotelettes a la soubise is very easily made boil half a dozen bermuda onions medium size in milk till quite tender press out all the milk chop them as fine as possible sprinkle a quarter of a salt spoonful of white pepper and one of salt over them then stir them with a tablespoonful of butter into half a pint of white sauce if the onions should thin the sauce too much they are sometimes very watery thicken with a yolk of egg or blend a teaspoonful of flour with the butter before stirring it in boil the sauce three minutes needless to say if the yolk of egg is added it must be beaten in after the sauce is removed from the stove and only allowed to thicken not boil the sauces so far given are what french cooks call grand sauces they are the most important part of the dish with which they are served and as we have seen give the name to it there are numberless other sauces of which the white sauce is parent that are however 
not indispensable to the dish they are served with by which i mean a boiled fish may be served with oyster sauce or dutch sauce the sauce being in this case simply the adjunct a dessert spoonful of capers put into half a pint of white sauce with a teaspoonful of vinegar makes caper sauce celery sauce is again white sauce with the pulp of boiled celery boil the white part of four heads of celery sliced thin in milk till it will mash this will take an hour perhaps more then rub the pulp through a coarse sieve and stir it into half a pint of white sauce made with half rich cream oyster sauce is white sauce made by using the oyster liqueur instead of stock the oysters should be bearded just allowed to plump in the liquor which must then be strained for the sauce using a gill of it with a gill of thick cream to make half a pint for this quantity a dozen and a half small oysters will be required shrimp sauce parsley sauce lobster sauce cucumber sauce and all the family are white sauces with the addition of the ingredient naming it cucumber sauce which is approved for fish is made by grating a cucumber and adding it with the water from it to some white sauce boil till well flavored and then strain if too thin boil till thick stirring carefully for shrimp sauce canned shrimps serve very well indeed they must be thrown for a minute into cold water well stirred in it to remove superfluous salt then drained and dried on a cloth put a gill of shrimps to half a pint of bechamel made with fish stock boil once and stir in just enough essence of anchovy to make the sauce a pale shrimp pink cardinal sauce is a handsome sauce for boiled fish it is made by drying the coral from a lobster then pounding it quite smooth with one ounce of butter until it is a perfectly smooth paste stir this into half a pint of bechamel it should be a fine red when mixed pass through a sieve and add as much cayenne as will go on the end of the blade of a small penknife hollandaise or dutch sauce is best made in the following way there are other methods but this one meets general approval is not difficult and agrees with many who cannot possibly eat it when oil is used make half a pint of drawn butter by melting one ounce of butter with one ounce of flour over the fire let them bubble together stirring the while for one minute then stir in half a pint of boiling water and half a teaspoonful of salt so far the making is exactly the same as for white sauce except that water is used instead of cream and stock boil once then set the saucepan in another of water and break up an ounce of butter into small pieces and add them stir briskly after each piece is added and see it blend before putting more when all is in add the beaten yolks of five eggs removing the saucepan from the fire while doing it they must be very carefully and gradually stirred in and when well mixed returned to the fire until they begin to thicken the eggs must be kept from curdling squeeze in two teaspoonfuls of lemon juice and add just a dust of cayenne this should be a thick yellow custard-like sauce and have a perceptible acidity without being sour end of chapter three chapter four of choice cookery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by marianne choice cookery by katherine owen chapter four brown sauces it has already been stated that the family of brown sauces like the white have one parent espagnol or spanish sauce which is the foundation for chateaubriand financier robert provard piquant and other sauces ordinary brown sauce like ordinary white is often made without stock simply an ounce of flour one of butter browned together and half a pint of boiling water added then boiled till thick and smooth but it may be safely said that in high-class dark sauces water should play no part its place must be taken by stock of good quality which is often enriched by reducing or adding glaze the characteristics of finely made spanish sauce are a clear beautiful brown by no means approaching black absolute freedom from grease and a fine high flavor so well blended that no particular spice or herb can be detected spanish sauce is made as follows 
wash peel and cut small six mushrooms or a dessert spoonful of mushroom powder one small carrot one small onion one shallot dry them and fry them a fine brown in a tablespoon of butter but do not let them burn drain off the butter melt in a copper saucepan two ounces of butter and two ounces of flour stir them together over the fire till of a pale bright brown then add a pint of stock the fried vegetables and a gill of tomato sauce let all gently simmer for half an hour with the cover off strain through a fine sieve when spanish sauce is to be served without any addition and not as a foundation a wine glass of sherry is used and the same quantity of stock omitted it becomes chateaubriand by the addition of a wine glass of sherry reduced to half a glass by boiling in a tiny saucepan a dessert spoonful of fresh parsley very finely chopped and the juice of half a small lemon these must be added to one-third the quantity of espagnole or spanish sauce given in the foregoing recipe then stir in gradually bit by bit one ounce of butter letting each piece blend before adding more i have said here and elsewhere the juice of half a small lemon yet i would caution the reader to squeeze it in gradually because some lemons are intensely sour and a very few drops of juice from such go farther than that of the whole half of an average lemon chateaubriand sauce is by no means acid there must be only a just perceptible dash of acidity and only so much lemon juice used as will give it zest piquant sauce is different there should be acidity enough to provoke appetite yet even this should be by no means sour to make piquant sauce chop a shallot fine put it with a tablespoonful of vinegar into a very small saucepan let them stew together until the vinegar is entirely absorbed but do not let it burn then add it to half a pint of spanish sauce and a gill of stock with a bay leaf and a sprig of thyme cook very gently ten minutes remove the thyme and bay leaf and add a dessert spoonful of chopped pickled cucumber a teaspoonful of capers and a dessert spoonful of finely chopped parsley simmer very slowly ten minutes more then add enough cayenne to lay on the tip of a penknife blade poivrade resembles piquant sauce very closely differing from it however by the addition of wine and high flavoring to make it fry an onion and a small carrot cut fine a tomato sliced and an ounce of lean ham in two ounces of butter let them brown slightly then add to them half a pint of claret a bouquet of herbs two cloves and six peppercorns let them simmer till the wine is reduced one half then add half a pint of good spanish sauce boil gently ten minutes strain and serve very hot a true french poivre has a sousson of garlic obtained by rubbing a crust on a clove of it and simmering it in the sauce before straining it but although many would like the scarcely perceptible zest imparted by this cautious use of garlic no one should try the experiment unless sure of her company a bouquet of herbs always means two sprigs of parsley one of thyme one of marjoram and a bay leaf so rolled together the bay leaf in the middle and tied that there is no difficulty in removing it from any dish which is not to be strained the well-known bordelais sauce is simply spanish sauce with the addition of white wine and shallots scald a tablespoonful of chopped shallots put them to half a pint of chablis sauterne or any other similar white wine let the wine reduce to one gill then mix it with half a pint of spanish sauce and the sixth part of a saltspoonful of pepper strain and serve robert sauce that excellent adjunct to beefsteak varies again from bordelais vinegar and mustard and fried onions taking the place of the wine and shallot chop three medium-sized onions quite fine fry them in a tablespoonful of butter until they are a clear yellowish brown stirring them constantly as they fry drain them and put them to half a pint of spanish sauce to which you add a wine glass of stock to allow for boiling away simmer gently twenty minutes add a pinch of pepper strain then mix a teaspoonful of vinegar in a cup with a teaspoonful of mustard stir this into the sauce sauce a la normande is one of the most delicious sauces for baked fish of any kind although usually associated with sole 
to half a pint of spanish sauce add a dozen mushrooms sliced in half a dozen small oysters with the beards removed and a dozen crawfish if they are to be had or their place may be taken by a tablespoon of shrimps packed canned shrimps washed and dried answer very well one tablespoonful of essence of anchovy and just a dust of cayenne pepper light normand is made by using bechamel instead of spanish sauce adding all the other materials and then it is a pale salmon-colored sauce excellent for boiled fish a favorite english sauce for fish which is also brown or pink according to whether it is intended for baked or boiled fish is the Doughton sauce to three quarts of a pint of bechamel add a dessert spoonful of anchovy essence and a small wine glass of sherry mix well and serve orange sauce for game is made with half a pint of spanish sauce boiled five minutes to make it rather thicker than usual the juice of three sweet oranges and the peel of one this peel must be so thinly pared as to be transparent boil this peel half an hour in water then shred it into fine even strips half an inch long and not thicker than broom straw stew this shredded peel another half an hour in a gill of stock with a scant teaspoonful of sugar then add it to the sauce with half a salt spoonful of salt and boil five minutes matelote may come in with the brown sauces although it is not made with spanish sauce as a foundation but only with strong stock it is used to simmer fish in when directed to be a la matelote and if it were already thickened the whole would burn it is made as follows half a pint of sauterne chablis half a pint of rich stock two bay leaves three leaves of tarragon chervil and chive a scant salt spoonful of salt a quarter one of pepper simmer these until reduced to one half pint a touch of garlic is indispensable to the true matelote but when used it must be done with the greatest caution a fork stuck into a clove of it then stirred in the sauce the fork when withdrawn not the garlic or a crust rubbed across a piece of it is the only way in which it should be used like the white sauces the family brown ones is very large but i have given those which require special directions others are simply spanish sauce with the addition of the ingredient which gives its name to it as brown oyster sauce is simply spanish sauce with oysters celery sauce mushroom sauce and so on it should always be remembered that the consistency must be preserved that is to say except when special mention is made of the sauce being thinner it should mask the spoon and if the addition made to it is of a kind to dilute it as mushrooms and part of their liqueur it must be rapidly boiled down to the original thickness in the same way when ingredients have been simmered in the sauce and this is very often the case then a wine glassful or half one of broth or stock should be allowed for the wasting in the next chapter we will make acquaintance with the miscellaneous sauces which are not built on the foundation of either white or brown sauce these are chiefly cold sauces although served with hot dishes at time as tartare remoulade etc end of chapter four chapter five of choice cookery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by marianne choice cookery by katherine owen chapter five cold sauces cold dishes which are such a pleasing feature of foreign cookery are much neglected with us at least in private kitchens where they are limited to two or three articles served in mayonnaise or a gelatin yet the dishes which the french call should fraud are both delicious and ornamental and it only requires a little taste care and perfect sauce to convert the ordinary cold chicken turkey or game into an elaborate and choice dish among cold sauces of course mayonnaise both green red and yellow reigns supreme indeed of late years it has become almost hackneyed yet no work on choice eating would be complete without the different forms of mayonnaise mayonnaise is one of those sauces in which everything depends on care and very little on skill and yet some women have quite a reputation for making it among their friends who often declare how unsuccessful their own efforts have been and that to succeed is a gift it is not as a novelty therefore that the manner of making it is given here 
but that those who believe they have not the magic fingers may take courage and try again first of all let me explain what seems to puzzle many i have been frequently asked how much oil can i use to two eggs the answer is as much as you choose or again how many eggs ought i to take to a quart of oil again the answer is one two three or four the egg is only a foundation and mayonnaise will come no better with two yolks than one although some chefs consider it keeps better when two eggs are used to a pint of oil a cool room is always insisted on for making the sauce but to the amateur i say oil eggs and bowl also should be put in the ice box until well chilled and even then mishaps may come from using a warm spoon from a hot kitchen drawer or closet that therefore must be cool also of course it is often successfully made with only the usual precaution of a cool room but with everything well chilled it is hard to fail if a very little of the sauce is wanted one yolk of egg will be better than two separate the yolks very carefully allowing not a speck of white to remain remove also the germ which is attached to the yolk stir the yolk at least a minute before beginning to add oil then arrange your bottle or sharp spouted pitcher on your left hand so that it rests on the edge of the bowl and you can keep up a pretty steady drop drop into the egg while you stir with your right steadily the oil must be added drop by drop but this does not mean a drop every two or three minutes you may add a drop to every one or two circuits of the spoon the reason for adding it slowly is that each drop may form an emulsion with the egg before more goes in after two or three minutes look carefully at the mixture if it has not begun to look pale and opaque but retains a dark oily appearance stir it steadily for two minutes and then add oil slowly drop by drop stirring all the time if it has not now begun to thicken it probably will not but the materials are not lost put the yolk of another egg into a cool bowl and begin again using the egg and oil you have already mixed in place of fresh oil when all this is used proceed with the oil it is hoped however that the work will have proceeded without the necessity for beginning afresh when the mayonnaise becomes quite thick use a few drops of vinegar to thin it then more oil until sufficient sauce is made then white pepper and salt should be added for seasoning the vinegar used should be very strong so that very little of it will be sufficient to give the necessary acidity without making it too thin this is especially the case when the sauce is required to mask salad it should for this purpose be set on ice until firm but in all cases be kept cold the best mayonnaise left in a warm kitchen would separate and become oily the stirring must be steady and constant and the task must not be left until completed mayonnaise is the basis of several other sauces so that in accomplishing it a great deal is done green mayonnaise is made by dropping a bunch of parsley into boiling water and in a minute or two when it becomes intensely green take it up pound it in a mortar and then through a sieve use as much pulp as will color the sauce a delicate green red mayonnaise used for cardinal sauce and other purposes is made by pounding lobster coral very fine and stirring it in it must not be forgotten that anything added to mayonnaise must be ice cold aspic mayonnaise is another form of the sauce used in dressing cold dishes and while more delicious than the usual sauce will keep its form for hours after the dish is dressed it is absolutely necessary to prepare it on ice put half a pint of stiff aspic jelly into a bowl and set in cracked ice whisk it with an egg beater until it is a white froth usually the motion will melt it but to save labor it may be set in lukewarm water to soften then beaten but no oil must be added again until it is ice cold froth then beat in very gradually a quarter of a pint of olive oil and a tablespoon of tarragon vinegar proceeding with the same care as for the usual mayonnaise add a salt spoonful of salt a pinch of pepper and the same of powdered sugar norwegian sauce is preferred by many to tartare for some purposes and is made by adding freshly grated horseradish to mayonnaise in the proportion of two tablespoons to half a pint tartare sauce is mayonnaise with the addition of mustard chives pickles and tarragon chopped as usually served it has only mustard and capers or chopped cucumbers but for those to whom a slight flavor of onion is not disagreeable chives should be added 
to half a pint of mayonnaise use a teaspoonful of dry mustard mixed with two of tarragon vinegar then stir into the sauce to this add a tablespoonful either of capers or chopped pickled cucumber this is the usual tartar sauce but the french recipe is a tablespoonful of finely chopped chives a tablespoon each of fresh tarragon and chervil in place of the pickles cold cucumber sauce is mayonnaise with an equal quantity of grated cucumber drained pressed and stirred into it with a salt spoonful of salt and a few drops of very strong vinegar horseradish sauce is a very good sauce for hot or cold beef roast or boiled grate three tablespoonsfuls of horseradish fine put to it a tablespoonful of sugar one of salt and one of vinegar or a tablespoonful of chablis wine let them soak an hour or two and the last thing before serving stir in four tablespoonsful of cream that is whipped very solid a half teaspoonful of dry mustard is sometimes mixed with the horseradish but that is a matter of taste when the sauce is to be served hot two yolks of egg and two tablespoonsful of water must be substituted for cream which would curdle the water horseradish etc must first come to the boiling point then the eggs added gradually and just allowed to thicken not to boil mint sauce take only the young tender leaves not a bit of stem and chop very fine indeed to two tablespoonsful add a tablespoonful and a half of brown sugar and three of vinegar it should be quite thick not as we so often see it vinegar with a few bits of mint floating around mint jelly for masking cold lamb or cutlets take two tablespoonsful of spanish sauce and dissolve in it a good teaspoonful of gelatin softened in cold stock a tablespoonful of aspic and one of thick mint sauce if no aspic is ready it is not worth while to make for the small quantity needed a teaspoonful of glaze two of gelatin and half a wine glass of sauterne may be dissolved together to take its place no gelatin will be needed with the spanish sauce in this case sweet sauces will be left until the desserts are treated of end of chapter five chapter six of choice cookery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by betty b choice cookery by katherine owen chapter six soups it is not proposed to give the soups to be found readily in most cooking books in these pages but only those less known or of peculiar excellence it is supposed that the reader understands the making of good beef or veal stock and perhaps the usual way of clearing it but since cooking has been studied scientifically improvements on methods have been introduced one of these is the clearing of soup with albumen of meat instead of egg the advantages of this method are that the soup is strengthened and the flavor improved while clearing with whites of eggs in the usual way though greatly improving the appearance tends to lessen the flavor of soup to clear consomme with beef consomme is reduced stock or stock made of extra strength carefully remove all fat from three pints of it when cold it will of course be a stiff jelly chop fine an onion a carrot and a turnip chop half a pound of lean beef from which all fat is removed this is best put through a chopping machine as it must be very fine put the consomme meat and vegetables into a saucepan stir them briskly till just on the boiling point remove the spoon let the soup boil up well one minute it should now be clear take a clean cloth fix it on a soup stand or in a colander pour boiling water through it to warm it thoroughly throw the water away and pour the soup gently through the cloth twice do not press or stir it it will be beautifully clear and of excellent color it is now ready to serve for a variety of soups named according to what is served in them consomme a la rachel this is consomme to which is added tiny quenelles made in egg spoons and colored red green and black quenelle meat is made from the uncooked breast of chicken or game the backs of hares or rabbits or it may be made for certain purposes of fish or very white veal first chopped and then pounded in a mortar 
until it is a perfectly smooth paste mere chopped meat is not what is required it must be fine enough to go through a sieve for consomme a la rachel however the breast of chicken is necessary take four ounces of chicken free from skin and sinew pound it until quite smooth the more it is pounded the better it is mix with it thick cream a scant salt spoonful of salt very little pepper and half a beaten egg until it is a softish paste yet firm enough to mould mix thoroughly now try a little by poaching in a teaspoon that is fill a teaspoon with the mixture pressing it in form then drop it into boiling water for three minutes open the quenelle and taste it if it is creamy light and well flavored it is right but if there is the least toughness add a little more cream to the mixture notice also the seasoning if more salt is needed add it carefully and try again till you have the quenelle mixture just right that is to say creamy light very tender yet keeping its form at present quenelles as entrees or for soups form such an important part of fine cooking that it is worth while to get the mixture perfect for other purposes than the present having your quenelle meat ready proceed to vary it as follows allowing one quenelle of each color to each guest for the green quenelles use sufficient pounded tarragon to color one-third of the meat delicately for the second use sufficient lobster coral pounded to redden it the third must be made dark with pounded truffles great care must be taken to keep the three portions separate so that one color may not injure the other to form them use two very small coffee spoons or egg spoons as the quenelle should not be larger than small olives butter the spoons slightly and when formed drop each for one or two minutes into boiling pale colored stock drop them as they are done into cold water in which they must be kept until you are ready to use them when the soup is to be served drain them lay the number required in the tureen and pour the boiling consomme on them they will not require heating in the soup it may be observed that raw spinach pounded and rubbed through a sieve and boiled red beet may be used to color the meat green and red and the rest left white the consomme is then called consomme d'orleans consomme au oeuf filet pour one quart of clear consomme to boil mix one egg one dessert spoonful of flour one tablespoonful of milk a pinch between forefinger and thumb of salt and a dust of pepper into a batter rub a nutmeg once back and forth over the grater and stir when the soup boils pass this batter through a fine strainer into it it should look like threads consomme a la sévigné pound two ounces of breast of cooked chicken until it will pass through a wide sieve mix with it two eggs three tablespoonfuls of milk twelve drops of almond essence a scant saltspoonful of salt as much nutmeg as will go on the end of a penknife blade and a dust of cayenne when well blended fill three or four small round muffin pans well greased and steam slowly twenty minutes or until set turn out very carefully let them cool then cut them into fancy shapes and serve in one quart of boiling consomme a few asparagus points boiled until just tender but not mushy are to be dropped in the last thing potage a la hollandaise for this will be required one quart of veal or chicken stock two ounces of butter one ounce of flour four yolks of eggs half a pint of cream one gill of green peas one gill of boiled carrots one gill of boiled cucumber one teaspoonful of fresh tarragon chopped fine one teaspoonful of sugar and one teaspoonful of salt trim the carrots and cucumber with a very small scoop or cutter the size and shape of peas cook them just tender and no more in boiling water put the stock on to boil skim if necessary add the salt and sugar break the eggs into a bowl add the cream to them and beat them till well mixed this forms a liaison make the butter and flour into a paste in a bowl pour half a gill of cold stock to it then enough hot stock to dissolve it when mixed smooth stir it into the boiling stock let it boil then remove from the fire and stir in very carefully to prevent curdling the liaison of eggs and cream let it come to the boiling point but not boil or it will curdle 
strain it into a clean stewpan and add the vegetables let all get hot together then strew in the tarragon chestnut soup puree de marron slit twenty-five large chestnuts at each end put them in boiling water and boil ten minutes drop them into cold water and remove both the outer and inner skin melt three ounces of butter in a saucepan put in the chestnuts and saute toss them about for a few minutes but do not brown them then add a pint and a half of rich white stock and let the nuts boil in it until very tender when they must be rubbed through a fine sieve boil up again add half a pint of cream a teaspoonful of powdered sugar a teaspoonful of salt less if the stock be salted and a pinch of pepper princess soup cut a chicken in pieces wash it butter a stewpan put in the chicken with a blade of mace an onion a bay leaf and twelve white peppercorns let this simmer closely covered ten minutes shaking it often to prevent its browning then put to it two quarts of hot veal stock and simmer one hour put into another stewpan two ounces of flour and two ounces of butter stir them together and let them bubble once then strain the liquor from the chicken to it stir well and cook a few minutes take the white meat from the bones of the chicken pound it in a mortar very fine stir it to the stock then rub through a soup strainer add just before serving half a pint of fresh cream and the juice of half a lemon this soup must be made hot but not boil after the chicken pulp and cream are added potage a la royale boil two ounces of macaroni till tender but not broken throw it into cold water put three pints of white stock to boil cut the macaroni into lengths half an inch long beat three yolks of eggs in a bowl with a gill of cream throw the macaroni into the soup when it boils remove from the fire add the cream and eggs and an ounce of grated parmesan cheese stir till the soup reaches the boiling point but by no means let it boil after the cream and eggs are added or it will be spoiled salt soup always in the proportion of a moderate teaspoonful of salt to the quart if the stock is seasoned only add salt for the cream eggs etc use just a suspicion of cayenne in making a soup to which eggs are added the utmost care is required yet not any more than in making custard the main point is to let the eggs come near enough to the boiling point to thicken yet far enough from it not to curdle this a little patience will accomplish by watching and removing the saucepan for a few seconds as the boiling point approaches then returning it do this once or twice till the opaque creamy appearance shows the eggs are done End of chapter 6chapter seven of choice cookery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b choice cookery by katherine owen chapter seven fish entrees instead of giving recipes for cooking fish whole for which excellent directions are to be found in several modern cookery books recipes for fish entrees will be substituted they are now frequently served at the fish course and by their convenience and economy as well as the variety they afford are likely to grow in favor another point for them is that they can often be made hours before and simply heated when needed thus relieving the cook of the most critical part of her work at the time when she needs her attention free some of these entrees will be more suited for breakfast luncheon or supper dishes than to precede a heavy dinner such for instance as the preparation of oysters when they have been also served before soup but the recipes are included here for their intrinsic worth fillet of cod a la normande butter a tin dish lay on it three slices of cod moderately thick an inch to an inch and a half pour over them one wine glass of white wine place a buttered paper over them and bake in a moderate oven fifteen minutes reduce another glass of wine in a stew pan by simmering add to it half a pint of white sauce twelve small oysters bearded and blanched twelve small quenelles and twelve button mushrooms season with pepper and salt 
simmer one minute only or the oysters will harden place the slices of fish on a hot dish pour the sauce over them place the oysters mushrooms and quenelles in groups in the corners of the dish lobster souffles cut up the meat of a boiled hen lobster into neat dice showing as much of the red as possible prepare as many small ramekin or souffle cases as may be required by pinning bands of writing paper round them two to three inches higher than the case take three tablespoonfuls of mayonnaise half a pint of stiff aspic jelly and a gill of tomato sauce in which a teaspoonful of gelatin has been dissolved every utensil used must be ice cold the jelly must be quite cold but not set put the tomato sauce the jelly and the mayonnaise which should be left on the ice till the last thing into a bowl set in another bowl of pounded ice whisk them together until they begin to look white then stir the lobster in it with a teaspoonful of very finely chopped chervil and tarragon fill the souffle cases piling the dressing high put them on a dish on ice when they are set carefully remove the paper bands sprinkle a little dried and sifted lobster coral over the tops and serve coquille of prawn pick the shells from four dozen prawns mix with one-third the quantity of mushrooms slightly stewed in a tablespoonful of butter and a saltspoon of salt the mushrooms must not be brown add four tablespoonfuls of allemande sauce fill the shells which must be well buttered dress each over with fine bread crumbs which have been carefully fried a golden brown put them in a cool oven twenty minutes only get thoroughly hot but not to cook coquille of salmon or halibut take one pound of cold halibut or salmon break it into small pieces put it in a stew pan with half a saltspoonful of salt and a tiny pinch of pepper and a half pint of white sauce a tablespoonful of very thick cream and a teaspoonful of anchovy sauce stir well and let all get hot butter some shells sprinkle over with a few fried crumbs fill with the mixture cover with the fried crumbs and put them in the oven to get thoroughly hot serve on a napkin salmon en papillote cut some slices of salmon into cutlets the right size for serving make paper cases to fit them then cover each slice with the following mixture two tablespoonfuls of salad oil beaten with the yolk of an egg one teaspoonful of parsley chopped one shallot chopped and one anchovy all these must be chopped as finely as possible a half saltspoonful of salt and a grain of cayenne mix spread on the fish envelop each piece in a well buttered case fasten up by pinching the paper well and bake half an hour serve in the papers filet of sole a la normande in speaking of sole one of course means the flounder which is coming to be called the american sole and when filet does make a fair substitute for the real thing and it is suitable for cooking in every way that the english sole can be used except whole a boiled flounder without filleting or a flounder fried whole as is so often done with sole would be very coarse fillet two flounders in cities this will be done by the fishmonger but in the country it may have to be done in the kitchen therefore directions for doing it will be appended lay the fillets neatly trimmed and shaped into a thickly buttered pan or dish either fireproof porcelain or any other that can go to table pour over them a glass of sherry and four tablespoonfuls of consomme cover with oiled paper and bake ten minutes in a moderate oven take out the pan pour over the fillets half a pint of sauce normande return to the oven for five minutes and serve in the pan sole a la lorly make a frying batter thus mix one tablespoonful of milk with two ounces of flour and a tablespoonful of salad oil to a smooth paste then add two yolks of eggs and the whites whipped firm with a quarter of a saltspoonful of salt mixed with an upward movement of the spoon so as not to deaden the whites of eggs set it aside while you prepare the sole mix a tablespoonful of salad oil a teaspoonful of chili vinegar a teaspoonful of tarragon vinegar a teaspoonful of parsley and one of onion chopped exceedingly fine a scant saltspoonful of salt and a quarter one of pepper mix all together then cut the fillets in half trimming away all ragged appearance 
and lay them for fifteen minutes in the mixture called a marinade take them out drain them on a sieve and then dip each fillet in the batter this batter should be just thick enough to coat the fish and run slowly off not cling in a thick paste round it a french rule for testing the thickness of frying batter is to dip a spoon in it and then let a drop run off the end on a plate if it drops freely yet keeps a bead-like form it is right fry each fillet in a wire basket three minutes in very hot deep fat serve with fried parsley turbans of sole a la rouennaise as these require a little of the same mixture as would be used for lobster cutlets or croquettes it is good management to have them when lobster is required for something else the mixture for the cutlets is made as follows less than a fourth of it would be required for the turbans remove all the flesh from a boiled hen lobster chop it small wash dry and pound the coral with an ounce of butter take one gill of white sauce mix the lobster coral and a tablespoonful of cream with it and boil five minutes mix in the lobster with a little salt unless the lobster is salt enough and a grain of cayenne this made into cutlets egged crumbed and fried is excellent but our purpose now is to use it for stuffing take as many fillet of sole as required spread the lobster mixture on each roll them up run a toothpick through them to keep them in shape trim till each will stand put them on a buttered baking sheet cover with buttered paper and bake ten minutes chop up two truffles two hard-boiled yolks of eggs and a tablespoonful of parsley each chopped separately take up the turbans pour over them half a pint of cardinal sauce and ornament the turbans one with the truffles one with the yolk of egg and one with parsley so on alternately directions for filleting flounders take a sharp knife cut away the fins all round the fish and split the flounder right down the middle of the back then run the knife carefully between the flesh and bones going towards the edge you have now detached one quarter of the flesh from the bone to the other half in the same way and when the back is thus entirely loose from the bone turn the fish over and do the same with the other side you will now find you can remove the bone whole from the fish detaching as you do so any flesh still remaining the bone then you have two halves of the fish and you have four quarters of solid fish to remove the skin take the tail end firmly between the thumb and forefinger of the left hand hold the skin side downward on the board and with your knife make an incision across the flesh then keeping the skin firmly between your thumb and finger push the knife between it and the flesh slightly humoring it to prevent tearing the flesh the skin parts quite easily but no attempt must be made to cut the fish from it End of chapter 7、Chapter Oysters a la Villeroi. Scald or blanch some large oysters, dry them, then drop them into some very thick Villeroi sauce. Let them get hot in it, but not boil. Take them out one by one, be sure they are thickly coated with the sauce, have a large dish heaped with sifted crumbs or cracker meal. As you lift each oyster from the sauce, lay it on the meal, turn it gently over in the meal, so that a light coat adheres. And the sauce is by no means rubbed off. Place them on an oiled plate where they will get quite cold so that the sauce may chill and form a whitish glaze under the crumbs. Beat two eggs with two tablespoonfuls of water, and when free from strings, dip each oyster in the egg using a small fork. Let superfluous egg drip off for a moment, then lay the oyster again on a deep bed of cracker crumbs. Cover well, pat very gently, and lay each as you do it on a dish sprinkled with them. Fry two minutes in very hot, deep fat, being careful the oysters do not touch each other. If I have made these directions as clear as I hope, 
it will be understood that each oyster has a rich creamy coating under the crumbs and every effort must be made to avoid breaking the outer shell of egg and crumb for this reason the fat should be heated to four hundred degrees but although great care in handling is necessary they are not difficult to succeed with when that care is given oyster kebabs there are two ways of preparing these dainties and i give both for those who cannot eat bacon the first will probably be acceptable for kebabs of any kind silver or plated skewers are proper although very slender wooden ones may be used put in a stew pan a small onion chopped very fine a dessert spoonful of parsley and a dozen mushrooms also chopped let these fry one minute in a large tablespoonful of butter add a dessert spoonful scant of flour stir all together then drop in as many fat oysters as are required they must have been blanched in their own liquor and the beards removed stir all round and add three beaten yolks of eggs one at a time taking care they do not curdle but get just thick enough to cling round the oyster string six oysters on each little skewer basting with the sauce wherever it does not adhere let each skewer cool then roll the whole in beaten eggs and abundant cracker meal so that the skewer will seem to be run through a sausage lengthwise fry two minutes in very hot deep fat serve on a napkin allow one skewer to each person two minutes if the fat be sufficiently hot will fry oysters a pale yellow brown they should never take longer than this for oysters harden and shrink if overdone in the least for this reason the use of a pyrometer when possible saves mistakes and trouble such articles as oysters smelts or any small things should be fried at temperature of three eighty degrees to four hundred degrees it must be remembered that all fried articles darken after they leave the frying kettle and therefore a very pale yellow becomes a golden color on the dish kebabs number two this is the recipe given by the author of the well-known pitchley books and is admirable take the beards from as many fat fair-sized oysters as required you require bacon of which the fat is thick enough through to allow of circles being cut from the slices as large as the oysters cut the bacon very thin get a cutter the size of the oysters trim them with it then cut eight circles of bacon for six oysters put first a piece of bacon then an oyster then more bacon on each little skewer till there are six oysters with a piece of bacon between each through the center and one at each end string them very evenly take a very little cayenne on the tip of a knife and a salt spoonful of salt mix this with two beaten eggs to which two tablespoonfuls of water have been added dip each skewer of kebabs in this let them drip an instant then lay them on a deep bed of crumbs or cracker meal cover them thoroughly shake them then dip again into the egg if this has become full of crumbs strain it and again lay them in the meal shake lightly again and arrange each skewer of kebabs in a frying basket and fry two minutes i have spoken in the foregoing directions for crumbing of using plenty of meal and experience tells me that the rule with those unfamiliar with proper methods is to use so little that a plateful would be considered plenty with this quantity no good work can be done you need to turn on to a board or dish at least a quart of crumbs or a whole box of cracker meal this will enable you to smother the article until every part is covered instead of sprinkling a little over and under which generally falls off as fast as put on and leaves a surface yellow with egg in parts as you must do if a small quantity only is used all the meal that is left must be carefully sifted and put away if the small masses of egg and crumb which will be mixed with it are not sifted out the cracker meal cannot be used again there must also be plenty of egg used for dipping
oysters in aspic for these dariole moulds are needed or the small fireproof china souffle cases which imitate paper may be used a dariole is a small straight-sided tin mould holding rather less than a gill they will be found at large house furnishing stores or a tin man could easily make them they being in fact like deep corn muffin pans if they are made to order avoid getting them too large three inches deep by two across will be large enough fill these moulds with aspic jelly nearly cold set them on ice while you prepare the oysters which must be bearded and cooked till plump in butter but not allowed to color when cool cut them in half throw them into some stiff bechamel which must be warmed till like thick cream sprinkle with a dust of cayenne lay the oysters to get cold that the bechamel may harden on them scoop the center very carefully out of the molds of aspic leaving a half inch thickness all round fill the centers with the oysters pour in more aspic cold but not set and put on ice for a few hours or till ready to serve the aspic from the centers should have been preserved and used to chop with more to garnish the dish turn the molds out very carefully and garnish with chopped aspic and watercress or parsley it is of course understood that bechamel sauce cold is like blanc mange and that anything coated with it will be enveloped in white jelly not in a sticky white sauce if bechamel does not become white jelly when cold the stock of which it is made is not stiff enough lobster in aspic is prepared as for salad the solid meat cut in dice and rolled in mayonnaise then in chopped chervelle or parsley then proceed exactly as for the oysters oysters a la tartare the oyster shells for serving oysters a la tartare must be of good shape and exquisitely clean therefore when using oysters on the half shell always pick out any that may be deep yet stand well and have a good shape scald and scrub them and keep for use scald as many fat oysters as required in their own liquor till firm three minutes at boiling point will usually do this the oysters must be just plump yet if underdone they will be flabby put them on ice choose as many tiny leaves as you have oysters from the heart of a lettuce they must all be of a size or trimmed so and the size only just large enough to line the shells without coming over them lay a leaf on each shell cut each oyster in half lay four halves in pyramid fashion on the lettuce leaf and mask the top of each just before serving with the tartare sauce allow two to each person end of chapter eight chapter nine of choice cookery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Choice Cookery by Catherine Owen. Various Culinary Matters. This little book does not pretend to go into what may be called the principles of cooking, except in so far as they are involved in the production of all choice cookery, and where it is considered that a principle is little known or too little attended to, the effort will be made to give it emphasis by reiteration here by principles of cooking i mean the simple rules by which roasting boiling stewing etc are successfully accomplished any book or series of articles written a dozen years ago would have been of no real use without these rudiments but within that period there have been cooking schools started and cookery books written so exceedingly exact in directions that it will be unnecessary to repeat them in choice cookery which does not pretend to include family cooking for this reason the cooking of joints of meat will not be entered into nevertheless there are certain rudiments of cooking which are not dwelt on usually in books they are taught in the cooking schools and those of my readers who have had the advantage of attending them will not need the instruction here given but i meet with many women who devote much time to the art of cooking 
and who have taught themselves by book and experiment all they know who yet when told to chop a small quantity of herbs very fine will struggle and chop almost leaf by leaf in their faithful endeavour to carry out the direction others less faithful finding their method chop some parts fine and leaves some leaves almost whole let it go at that with the reflection that that must do as it would take all day to get them all one degree of fineness so although it may seem almost too trivial a point to need mention we will go into the matter of herb chopping lemon grating etc that the simple operations may be performed easily and in a very short time to chop herbs use the leaves only never the stems let them be fresh and crisp or if wilted leave them in water for a time gather the leaves firmly between the thumb and three fingers of the left hand shave them through with a sharp knife as you push them forward under it the process resembles shaft cutting by hand machine turn them round gather them up again and cut across them in the same way then finish by chopping quickly holding the point of the knife with the left hand and bringing it down on the little heap of herbs with the right always gathering them together as fast as the chopping scatters them five minutes will chop a tablespoonful of mint or parsley almost to pulp a sharp steel knife and a small board must be used not the chopping bowl french books often direct so much fine herb to be used english books mean the same thing when they call for sweet herbs and a mixture of one part marjoram two parts thyme and three parts parsley is meant by both the grating of a lemon is a most simple operation and it may seem that every one must know how to do it but this is far from being the case as many dishes of curdled custards and sauces are caused by this fact the right way in this case is very important the object of using grated rind of lemon is to obtain the fragrance and flavor which differ very greatly from any extracts however good now the whole of the oil which contains this fragrance is at the surface is in fact the yellow portion of the rind therefore this and only this must be removed with the grater the white part underneath is bitter and will cause milk or cream to curdle but it contains no particle of lemon flavor yet when lemon flavor is called for the lemon is often grated right down to the pulp in parts while the yellow rind is left on in patches a lemon should be grated evenly beginning at the end and working round it using as small a surface of the grater as possible to prevent waste the habit of turning the lemon as you grate comes as easily as to turn an apple under the knife when peeling generally twice across the grater and back between each turn will remove all the essential oil but while guarding against grating too deeply care must be taken to remove the whole of the yellow surface a well grated lemon should be exactly of the same shape as before have no deep scores into the pith and have an oily looking surface perhaps before proceeding to the preparation of the combination dishes known as made dishes or entrees a few words may be useful to those readers whose ambition to accomplish results may cause them to defeat their own ends to such i would say go slowly never attempt the more difficult thing until the simpler one is beyond chance of failure thus in following the instructions in this book the wiser women will have accomplished perhaps each week one or two things they may have selected and it must not be forgotten the plan of the work is that one recipe shall serve as a key to many others a great many will very likely have delayed trying to make the sauces until the dish for which they will be required is given this is a mistake because it is less annoying to fail with a sauce with no dish depending on it than say when you have decided to have sole a la roi, the soles being ready and fail with the sauce i hope that no failure will come to any one trying the recipes here given but in some cases especially in sauces thickened with eggs a second's diverted attention may cause failure without fault of the cook therefore it is best to make single experiments when there is no danger of being disturbed and when there is nothing else to be attended to 
the successful result need never be lost for in the case of sauces they can be reheated the next day in a bain marie or pan of hot water the same with the soups and indeed most other things except souffles and omelettes but above all things never try a recipe for the first time the day you wish it to appear perfect on your table try it long before and if you fail make the same thing over again reading the directions very carefully some trifling caution or precaution may have escaped you no one ever learns to draw so simple a thing as a circle who is discouraged at the first bad curve and leaves it for easier lines keep on at the thing you select to do until you succeed always choosing and perfecting the easiest thing in each class first end of chapter nine chapter ten of choice cookery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b choice cookery by katherine owen entrees fillet of beef this favorite dish with french and americans may be roasted whole or cut so as to serve individually to roast it whole it must be trimmed perfectly round and either larded or not as taste may dictate a fillet weighing four pounds should be roasted three-quarters of an hour in a sharp oven it may then be served a la chateaubriand by pouring over it half a pint of the sauce of that name with horseradish sauce or brown mushroom sauce brown sauce with mushrooms added to serve individually fillets are prepared in the following way cut a fillet into eight slices three-quarters of an inch thick trim the slices into perfect circles all exactly the same size flatten them put them in a hot pan and saute for seven or eight minutes in two ounces of butter dress them round a dish and pour over them the sauce from which the dish will take its name fillet de boeuf a la bernays serve with half a pint of bernays sauce fillet de boeuf aux champignons dress as before leave in the centre of the dish room for a mound of stewed mushrooms pour over the fillets half a pint of rich brown sauce serve these dishes as soon as cooked the meat is spoiled by waiting i have received several letters from readers living where lobster is only to be had in cans asking if there is no substitute for the coral in making cardinal sauce canned lobster frequently contains a great deal of coral which is as good for coloring and flavoring as the fresh this can only be known however before opening when the cans are of glass the pulp of red beetroot passed through a sieve and added to white sauce or mayonnaise gives a beautiful red tint but the flavor while excellent for a salad or as vegetable sauce would be unsuitable for serving with fish grenadines of beef with mushrooms and poivrade sauce take as many slices of fillet of beef cut three-quarters of an inch thick as you require trim them to a pear shape three and a half inches long and three wide at the broadest part lard these with bacon and put them into a saute pan with a gill of brown sauce and a glass of sherry half the sauce if there are very few grenadines let them cook gently for fifteen minutes dissolve a piece of glaze the size of a walnut by putting it in a cup which is set in boiling water when dissolved take up the grenadines dish them in a circle and glaze them a brush is properly used for this purpose but the glaze can be spread with a knife dipped in hot water fill the centre of the circle with a pyramid of small mushrooms mixed with a gill and a half of poivrade sauce fillet of beef a la grande bretagne cut two pounds of fillet into neat slices an inch thick slit them with a small french boning knife or small penknife in such a way that you form a pocket in each of the mouth or opening of which is smaller than the pocket itself this can be done by laying the fillet flat on a board laying your hand on the top of it making a slit two inches wide then with the point of the knife enlarging the slit inside but not the entrance to it the opening should extend halfway through into this put a force meat made of horseradish sauce 
and macaroni boiled and cut fine the force meat must be used sparingly so as not to increase materially the thickness of the fillet fasten the opening of each with a wooden toothpick saute these fillets for fifteen minutes glaze them as directed in last recipe arrange them in a circle with a pyramid of tiny potato balls in the centre pour rich brown sauce round mutton cutlets a la duxelles cut some cutlets from the neck of mutton leaving two bones to each trim very carefully remove the upper part of one bone split the cutlets without separating them at the bone spread some thick duxelle sauce inside fold the cutlets together run a toothpick through them and broil for four minutes on each side over a hot fire have a layer of chopped mushrooms stewed in butter in the dish lay the cutlets on it pour over some duxelle sauce and garnish with truffles cut in very thin circles mutton cutlets a la milanaise take six cutlets from a neck of mutton french chops many butchers term them mix equal quantities of grated parmesan cheese and cracker meal dip the cutlets into a rich brown thick sauce then into the cracker and parmesan shake off loose crumbs dip them now into beaten egg in which a little salt and very finely chopped parsley and chives have been mixed and then dip them a second time in the parmesan and bread crumbs drop them into a kettle of very hot fat in four minutes they will be done do not fry more than four at a time as too many cool the fat dish them in a circle with spaghetti dressed with parmesan in the center it seems to me just here that before giving further recipes for fried articles i had better make sure that all my readers understand the process of frying in deep fat i have used the word saute too and although no doubt both these processes are familiar to most readers who would be likely to practice choice cookery for those who are not adepts many of the recipes would be impossible to execute frying once understood is so easy a process one wonders that so few should excel in it to those who are not sure of themselves i recommend practice a couple of hours practice and careful observance of rules will enable a bright woman to fry successfully for this practice you may prepare several different articles and fry one after the other one or two very soft and creamy croquettes one or two breaded articles especially such as are dipped in thick sauce before being crumbed etc the principles on which articles that are very soft and creamy underneath the surface of egg and crumbs are fried is this the creamy substances whether rich sauce like duxelles and villois or the cream used to mix croquettes must always be made of stock that will jelly when cold the sauce is used warm and the articles are put to chill on ice so that they are in a jellied condition now the fat into which they are plunged must be so hot that it sets the coating of egg and crumbs which forms a thin shell as it were before the jelly has had time to melt the shell once formed the interior cooks in the intense heat very quickly if the fat were not hot enough croquettes would go all to pieces and articles coated with sauce would lose the better part of it to fry you require a stew pan or iron kettle those called scotch kettles are best as they set into the range readily a frying pan is only useful for sautéing in little fat articles to be fried must be immersed in fat and no frying pan is deep enough to do this safely put two to three pounds of clarified dripping or lard into the kettle and let it get very hot this will be after it ceases to sputter some time after perhaps but you must now begin to watch for smoke to rise from the centre have near you some little squares of bread crumb drop one in from time to time only when it colours immediately is the fat hot enough at this point no time must be lost and your frying begins of course you will have the articles you intend to fry right at hand you will also need a large dish in which you lay common butcher's wrapping paper often called kitchen paper and a perforated skimmer some like a frying basket and for very small things it is an assistance but for croquettes cutlets etc it is not necessary 
they can be laid on the skimmer and dropped in the fat the easiest and safest way to fry is to use a cooking thermometer pyrometers or frymometers they are sometimes called and let the fat be three hundred eighty degrees for croquettes oysters and articles that only require two minutes cooking three hundred sixty degrees for cutlets and heavier articles the time required for articles to cook in the frying kettle seems astonishingly short for instance a breaded chop will be cooked to a medium degree in two and a half minutes well done in three minutes but it must be remembered the heat is intense croquettes must never be left longer than two minutes while white bait which however requires special instructions to fry without getting them into a cake need less than a minute potatoes require longer than most things but the fat need not be cooler at first as would seem necessary because they are so full of water even when well dried that they cool the fat rapidly sautéing a word that would be expressive of the process in english would be a boon to writers on cooking the process generally meant by frying is really sautéing yet so general has been the misconception among all but professed cooks that one has to take the precaution in giving directions for frying to say fry in deep fat it ought to be understood that to fry is to immerse in hot fat if some term suitable for kitchen use could be found half the difficulty would be over in old english books a very fair translation was used they told you to toss the article in butter but though it rendered saute jump fairly it did not express the process there is neither tossing nor jumping about it unless an occasional shake to the pan be called so and as flat frying dry frying are awkward the sooner we boldly take saute into common use and let it become a kitchen word as familiar as fricassee which surely must have been very unfamiliar once the better to saute although every bridget or gretchen fancies she can do it requires nicety and care to do it well and is far more difficult than frying in deep fat the pan requires to be hot also the fat or butter used which should cover the bottom of the pan a bright fire is required things that take long to cook require more fat than those that require but a short time effort must be made to adjust the proportion as adding cold fat prevents browning veal cutlets and many other things are far better sautéed than fried the articles sautéed require to be watched that they do not burn yet they must not be too often turned or they will not brown except of course such things as are chopped which require frequent stirring up in speaking of chilling articles coated with sauce to be fried i omitted to give the caution that in the case of meats care must be taken not to leave them long enough to freeze the meat end of chapter ten chapter eleven of choice cookery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b choice cookery by katherine owen chapter eleven entrees of mutton cutlets or chops mutton cutlets a la duchesse take as many cutlets or french chops as required stew them in stock with a small bouquet of herbs very gently until they are perfectly tender take them up skim the stock and strain it return to a small saucepan and reduce the liquid to a glaze dip each cutlet in the glaze and lay it aside have ready what cooks now call a panada made of a gill of thick white sauce two yolks of eggs stirred into it and allowed to approach the boiling point but not to boil this of course must be done in a double boiler or the eggs will curdle chop a dessert spoonful of parsley very fine parboil and chop also very fine three onions pound thoroughly in a mortar eight mushrooms stir these all into the thick sauce with a saltspoonful of salt and a quarter one of pepper roll each cutlet in this force meat if found too stiff to adhere properly moisten with a little cream or a little liquor from the mushrooms 
lay them on a fireproof dish and cover with bread crumbs and bits of butter bake them until they are a golden brown serve with brown soubise sauce lamb cutlets en concombre trim and cut six lamb cutlets three quarters of an inch thick flatten them a little to make them of equal size and thickness flour them and saute them in butter five minutes the fire must be sharp because they must be a nice brown on both sides arrange them round an entree dish with a gill of brown sauce poured outside and a pint of fillet of cucumber in the centre to prepare fillet of cucumber cut firm fresh cucumbers lengthwise through the middle remove seeds and all soft parts cut into inch lengths and into olive shapes all the same size put them into a stew pan with an ounce of butter a pinch of pepper a saltspoonful of sugar and one of salt and let them stew until quite tender without acquiring any color to do this the stew pan must be closely covered and frequently shaken lamb cutlets with a puree of mushrooms trim and cook and serve the cutlets as in the foregoing recipe only in place of the cucumbers make a puree of mushrooms in the following way stew half a pint of button mushrooms and part of their liquor in half a pint of white sauce until they are very tender taking care the sauce does not burn pound them in a mortar then force them through a vegetable strainer then add enough of the white sauce in which they were stewed to make the puree the substance of very thick cream cold lamb cutlets in mint jelly roast a piece of what butchers call the rack of lamb which is really the neck and ribs let it get cold cut from it six cutlets which trim just as if they were uncooked that is to say remove meat and fat from the bone and scrape it mask each of the cutlets in mint jelly warmed enough to be half fluid arrange very carefully round an entree dish when they are perfectly set so that the jelly will not come off have a russian salad in the centre how to prepare the salad to prepare this you require two or three small vegetable cutters of pretty shape use them to trim carrots white turnips and cucumbers into small attractive forms boil these in separate waters till tender also green peas sprays of cauliflower and very tiny young string beans throw each vegetable as it is cooked into ice-cold water to keep the color have some red beetroot boiled before it is cut into shapes use equal quantities of each vegetable arrange them with peas in the center and the others in circles round studying the effect of color then dress but do not mask them with green mayonnaise at seasons when materials for russian salad cannot readily be obtained the chops may be served with a center of cucumber salad or one made of the small white leaves of lettuce cutlets chaud foie a la russe for this cold dish mutton cutlets are used they must be of the finest quality and from mutton not newly killed cut as many cutlets as required trim and scrape the bone braise for an hour in a moderate oven till the meat is very tender remove and press between two dishes until they are cold then trim each cutlet into perfect shape boil a quart of strong stock which already jellies down to less than half a pint dip each chop into this glaze once or twice till they look varnished you now require a pint of stiff aspic jelly turn it out of the bowl cut one or two slices a quarter of an inch thick from it to be cut into shapes or croutons with the cutter to garnish the cutlets chop the rest of the aspic lay it round the dish and the cutlets against it with the croutons of aspic to form the outer edge the center must be filled with a russian salad in this case stirred up with very thick mayonnaise instead of being formally arranged the mayonnaise must only be sufficient to dress the vegetables none to run into the other materials and beetroot must be added last as it discolors the sauce if stirred up in it entrees of sweetbreads sweetbreads a la suprême take two plump sweetbreads lay them an hour in strong salt and water then boil them for ten minutes in fresh water put them between two plates to flatten till cold cut off all the gristle and loose skin from underneath put them to stew very gently 
in half a pint of good flavored stock take them up drain well and stew them in half a pint of sauce supreme with a dozen small mushrooms for ten minutes sweetbreads with oysters prepare the sweetbreads as in the foregoing recipe quarter them and put them in a stewpan with a gill of white stock the strained liquor from two dozen oysters a saltspoonful of salt a pinch of pepper and a suspicion of nutmeg put two ounces of butter in a stewpan over the fire stir into it one tablespoonful of fine flour let them bubble together stirring the while one minute when the sweetbreads have been simmering twenty minutes pour the gravy from them to the sauce stir quickly till smooth if thicker than very thick cream add a little more stock in five minutes add the oysters keep at boiling point but not boiling till the oysters are firm and plump do not leave them in the sauce a minute beyond this or they will begin to shrink take them and the sweetbreads up and if the sauce is too thin to bear a wine glass of cream boil it rapidly down till very thick then skim and just before pouring over the sweetbreads stir in a wine glass of thick cream if it goes in earlier it may curdle it has been explained before but i repeat it here that there must never be too much sauce however good to any dish and that the consistency is most important it must be thick enough to mask a spoon yet run from it freely nothing can be worse than a dab of white mush being served as sauce unless it be a quantity of thin milky sauce floating on every plate this is where the happy medium must be struck it is perfectly easy to give exact proportions to produce certain degrees of thickness and this has been done in the chapters on sauces but where these sauces are used as a medium in which to cook for instance sweetbreads a certain amount of liquid must be added to prevent burning now it is impossible to say how fast this added liquid will diminish if the simmering is as slow as it should be it may lose hardly at all in which case the article stewed must be taken out and a few minutes hard boiling given to evaporate the liquid and bring the sauce back to the proper point sweetbreads in cases prepare two sweetbreads as directed in the foregoing recipes put them in a stew pan with a thin slice of fat boiled ham half a carrot half a turnip and a small onion all cut small and laid as a bed under the sweetbreads put in a gill of broth a bouquet of herbs and half a saltspoonful of salt with a pinch of pepper let them stew closely covered one hour turning them after the first half hour when done take them up and drain them when cold cover with thick duxelles sauce sprinkle thickly with very fine bread crumbs make two rough paper cases butter each liberally and very carefully lay each sweetbread in one crumbed side uppermost put them in a quick oven till pale brown have ready proper sweetbread cases slip them neatly into them and serve these are excellent cold in which event they should not be shifted from the rough case until ready to serve end of chapter eleven